I'll tell you, I, I love the college and it's uh, meant the world to me. It's changed my life uh, forever. And I'm indebted to the institution and to the people that, that uh, invested in me early on. And um, I'm, I'm here to try to pay it forward. Hi, and welcome to Conversations Beneath the Cupola, a Gettysburg College podcast. I'm Bob Giuliano, president of the college and your host. Over the course of the last month, we've been using this podcast to explore the uncertainty that surrounds the global pandemic. We've heard from faculty who have helped us make sense of the outbreak from economic, political, and epidemiological perspectives. We'll return to this work in future conversations. Today, we turn our attention to one of our most accomplished alumni, Troy Datcher. In doing so, we are reminded about the many ways the college contributes to society. Our faculty generates knowledge that enhances our understanding of the world. Our students participate in that work with our faculty and ready themselves for lives of meaning and contribution. As alumni and shaped by their experiences here, our graduates help make the world a better, healthier, more prosperous, and more joyful place. Troy Datcher exemplifies the Gettysburg graduate making a difference in the world. He graduated from the college in 1990 and currently serves as the Senior Vice President and Chief Customer Office at Clorox. In this role, he has responsibility for the company's worldwide sales organization. He's also been named to the 2020 Ebony Power 100, an honor that recognizes influential change agents, thought leaders, and titans of industry. He is a member of the college's Board of Trustees. He is also someone whose good judgment I've quickly come to rely upon. So Troy, first, congratulations on your selection as one of the 2020 Ebony Power 100. Boy, it's really quite a remarkable honor. And as I understand it, not the first time that you have received it. Say a word or two about it. How does that come about? And how do you react to that? I mean, it really is quite something. How do you react to that on a personal level? And in these days, how does it get celebrated? Well, you know, Bob, well, when you make a list, uh, that includes names like Patrick Mahomes, you know, who's a Super Bowl champion, and Simone Biles, who's an Olympic champion, and John Legend, and Jada Pinkett, and um, you know, filmmaker Tyler Perry. It's quite a surreal feeling. You know, I, I was quite surprised to receive the phone call from Ebony's uh, chairman and CEO, Willard Jackson, and um, you know, I didn't quite have his number locked in my phone, so I was <laughs> surprised when I got the call. And uh, to your point earlier, it was my second time being named to the list. And um, I never thought that that could actually happen. And so I was very surprised and honored and humbled. And, you know, when I was at the gala a couple of years ago, when they would mention my name and they would also say Prince and Beyonce, <laughs> it was kind of surreal. So I expect that the moment uh, that we all gather for the celebration, um, will be surreal again. And so the celebration consists of recognition in the magazine and uh, a gala in the honor of the, the awardees. And uh, this year it's in Los Angeles and there's a conversation going on around actually having it televised. And so that would be an exciting new twist to the programming for the event. Uh, but it is a quite a surreal moment. For sure. Well, uh, congratulations. It does sound like you're going to be obliged to sing. You're either sing or a jump shot. I don't know which, just given the, given the people you're going to be with. So we'll yeah. have to see. Yeah, I, I don't have any of those talents. So I'll just, <laughs> I'll just listen when I'm talking to those folks. Um, so uh, about a year or so ago, as I was making my tour around to uh, talk to some of the trustees, I visited you at Clorox. And it was about at that time that you um, were promoted to this position that you have as senior vice president and chief customer officer. My guess is that our listeners won't exactly know what that title means. Um, can you explain that a little bit for us? Because it's going to bear on the next question I'm going to ask you. Yeah, you know, um, my mom asked me the same question, Bob, like, so what do you really do over there? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I have global responsibilities for the sales company. And so we are $6 billion company, um, sell our products in about 100 countries around the world, to have offices in about 25 countries. And I lead the sales organization for, for the company. So in a nutshell, my role is to, you know, make sure we're building strategies and outlining priorities and plans to drive the company's growth. Um, you know, in addition to that, I'm responsible for all the talent, uh, all the policies in terms of our go-to-market, and really leading the vision for the function. 
And uh, one of my most important aspects of my job is people management. I've got approximately 900 sales pe people in the, in the organization globally. And my leadership team is really responsible for recruiting, developing, and, re and the retention of, of the great talent that we have as an organization. Boy, what a remarkably broad range of responsibilities and in some respects, a daunting set of responsibilities uh, because they are so broad and it touches so many aspects of the, of the company. And so what I remember, Troy, is being in the conference room. Um, again, I think you'd just been promoted and you were reflecting on the search process itself. And you made some comments about how your liberal arts education, you thought helped you particularly understand this moment in time for Clorox and let you articulate a vision that um, perhaps distinguished you from some of the other people in the pool. Can you say a word or two about that? Absolutely. You know, there's so many aspects of my Gettysburg College experience that, that really made the difference, in my opinion. Uh, and that's both in the classroom and outside the classroom. So in the classroom, you know, really focusing on developing my critical thinking skills, my communication skills, you know, verbally and written, very, very important. And my approach to problem solving, um, you know, that teamwork that comes along with problem solving, I all learn in the classroom. And I had teachers that really cared and pushed me as well. Um, but those, those things I really lean on uh, intellectually uh, in those conversations that I'm having at a very senior level in the organization. As you can imagine, you, you, you know, the talent um, in the C-suite um, is pretty uh, impressive. <laughs> um, and uh, and I, I lean on everything I learned uh, at Gettysburg in order just to, to, to keep up and compete at times. But outside the classroom, I think was uh, just as valuable for me. And, you know, I was involved in numerous clubs. Some people may say way too many clubs and activities, but they really shaped my experience in, in terms of my leadership approach that I use today. Um, it was a lot of trial and error back then. A lot of people I probably need to apologize to because I was learning my way in terms of how to manage things and manage people and situations. And uh, But all of those things, I think, were collectively important as I walked into the interview process. And I'm very thankful of the foundation that, that that experience gave me in order to lean on for that moment. That trial and error, of course, is I think an, an inevitable and inherent, and in fact, a valuable part of any collegiate experience, but I think particularly in a place like Gettysburg where it's so intimate and you have so many opportunities to test yourself. Uh, yes. in a way that's harder to do in a big place. And yes. you know, I'm not going to get the old saw right, Troy, but to the effect that you learn more from failure than you do from success. And Absolutely. so some of those errors really end up shaping the way we see the world and we see ourselves and our own strengths and what we need to work on. Absolutely. The whole notion of the retail industry has changed in a significant way as well as Amazon and other means of direct consumer purchasing have disrupted normal approaches to um, uh, the way in which uh, consumers buy products. Again, part of what we talked about at the time was the sense that it takes a sort of more creative way of looking at the world uh, in order to make sense of this and to figure out how to position the company going forward how did your, and maybe this is a repeat of the same question, and if so, I apologize, but how did the Gettysburg education help you or did it help you in think about approaching a world that's changing as quickly and as profoundly as yours is? Well, I'll tell you, Bob, um, you know, when I walked into that interview um, over a year ago, I talked about the change that was going to happen within the industry. Um, what I didn't realize at that time is that that change would happen overnight versus over a five year period. You know, what this pandemic has done is really accelerated all of the changes that we were talking about, you know, 12, 18 months ago. It's really, really um, been an accelerant to uh, a new world in terms of how consumers shop and it's impacting their behavior in so many ways that we're trying to unpack and uncover how it will have an impact on us long-term, but I can tell you, uh, it's something that you have to embrace. And so I, I would say, you know, don't fight change, embrace it. Um, you know, companies, industries, uh, institutions that have been disrupted just didn't recognize or embrace that change was occurring all around them. Um, and I think you have to understand where the puck's headed and uh, make tough decisions to evolve. And, you know, change is inevitable, disruption is inevitable, 
uh, you know, can look back on a lot of industries that have been disrupted, you know, whether it's transportation with Uber or, you know, the hotel in industry with Airbnb, those are everyone's top of mind examples, but know that um, change is going to occur. And, um, you know, I've been at Coox for 20 years and there's some great things about an organization that has not changed a lot in 20 years, but there needs to be some evolution in order to keep up with the pace of change that's occurring. You know, we're a hundred year old company and the reason we've been around for a hundred years is because we've been able to disrupt ourselves, make sure we're evolving, whether that's our portfolio choices, um, you know, how we go to market, how we market to consumers, the relationships we build with consumers and our customers all have to evolve. And, um, you know, I'm a big believer that you've got to embrace change and not fight it. You know, I said in my introduction of you that you're someone whose good judgment I've quickly come to rely upon. Um, and it's both because of your good judgment and also the experience that you uh, that you that you bring to the board of trustees and help me and others think about the changing world of higher education. So as you look at what you're learning at Clorox and the changes that you're experiencing, what you see from the board of trustees, the perch that you have about higher education in Gettysburg College, how do you see those lessons applying to what we're trying to do? Because we too are facing, because of the pandemic, but even apart from the pandemic, a rapidly changing um, orientation towards higher education. How would you help us think about the future of Gettysburg College and higher education from the prism of what you've experienced at Clorox? Well, the good news is I think the college has been thinking about that. You know, um, I've actually sat in many conversations as a board member where we're spending time not just talking about uh, the the day's challenges, but really the challenges of tomorrow. And so those things are, um, I, I think, are, are very smart <laughs> things to contemplate. And, um, you know, I, so I feel good about the fact that the college is dealing in reality. You know, whether that is the changing demographics in this country and the plans that have been put in place to address that, whether it's the understanding the economic impact um, that could have a a material impact on the college's um, standing as a institution that is, uh, you know, solid from a financial standpoint. I feel like we're 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 embracing those changes. What may be the the change that hit us the most because of the pandemic is all of the virtual learning. And I know there are things we discussed as a board uh, regarding those topics. So it wasn't a new topic for us to discuss, and there was work going on by Chris Zappi and others to think up through, you know. Uh, the future when it comes to virtual learning. Um, but what, I, what I'll say is I think we've done a great job of uh, anticipating some of those challenges, embracing that. And uh, as a result, uh, I think we're in a much better position than other institutions. You know, I, the one thing we always lean on, Bob, is um, something that is that we have that many others don't, which is we have some programs uh, of distinction that are just unique um, and provide just unique opportunities for our students. And I think we'll continue to attract the best and the brightest uh, as we, long as we keep, you know, that disruption mentality in mind uh, and making sure we're taking advantage of the things that have made us great in the past, we're going to be just fine. So I, I strongly agree with that. And that was very well said. The One of the things I've learned in my early days here is just the really strong relationship between the board and the administration of the college and how symbiotic it is. We learn from each other, we play off each other. Um, I, again, I get to take advantage of your expertise in thinking about uh, where the college is going. Um, my colleagues have the same relationship with other members of the board. So it really makes an enormous difference. And I think it keeps us well situated to address the challenges, which are not insignificant, that the college will face ahead as well as all of higher education. So uh, shifting gears a little, you attended the college in the late 1980s and early 1990s. It was a less diverse place than it is today. Uh, That's the understatement, Bob. Yes, I was going to say substantially less diverse than it is today. So how did you end up at Gettysburg? And what was your experience as one of the few African-Americans on campus uh, at that time? Well, I had a cousin in Philadelphia, Diane Datcher, who uh, had met a dean from the college and his name's Harry Matthews. And Harry was the first leader of the Intercultural Resource Center on campus. And she 
you know, as I was having conversations about college institutions I was interested in, she called me up and said, hey, I met this dean from Gettysburg College. It's a small liberal arts school. I think you'd be great in a small setting. And I was looking at a lot of large institutions and she just challenged me to just reconsider that. And so I had lunch with Dean Matthews uh, on campus and, um, you know, he issued a challenge to me in that conversation. Uh, and the challenge was, you know, you can go to an institution and be one of 20,000 students, or you can come to Gettysburg College and be one of 2,000 and you can make a difference. And he issued that challenge to me and it really, really spoke to me. Um, and, you know, I'm you know 18 years old and um, sitting there with a decision to make and it just, it literally spoke to me. I, I, well, I got up, went to a pay phone, called my mom and I said, I'm gonna go to Gettysburg College. <laughs> So um, that was really how I got there. I'm really thankful for that moment uh, and that challenge that Dean Matthews uh, issued to me personally. Um, did you manage to, um, how did that challenge play out over the course of your four years? And did you find the experience what you had hoped it was gonna be? More than that, Bob. I mean, more than I could ever imagine. It, it's the main reason that I'm so connected to the institution today. and you know, the reason that I give my time and a little bit of my cash, but most of my time <laughs> to the institution, you know, I, it's because of the material impact that the experience had on me. You know, I, um, I, I came from rural Alabama. Um, you know, there's a lot of issues regarding, uh, you know, race and inclusion that I dealt with as a kid growing up. Probably I had really tough skin when it came to those kind of things. And, and candidly, um, I didn't have a lot of expectations that people would treat me fairly. Mm. And uh, I can tell you that, you know, while I did face some issues on campus, uh, those aren't the things that stand out in my mind. What stands out in my mind really is, um, you know, the trust that I began to, 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 to really uh, to respect from other students on campus. You know, I, I remember running for student senate and being skeptical that I could win. Uh, you know, because I, I thought, well, who's going to vote some, for someone who doesn't look like them, right? And I'll never forget the day uh, when I got the news that I was elected. I literally said to myself, as I was standing in Apple, in, you know, in, in Apple, the Apple dorm before I was walking into my room, that this changes everything. Okay. And literally from that moment, Bob, I actually stopped pointing to differences as the issue why I didn't, something didn't go my way. And I am, you know, I'm not saying that that's never happened before, you know, uh, you know, in the past and in my, over my career. But I can tell you that since that moment, I first have to eliminate quite a few other things before I land on that conclusion. Yeah, that's really interesting. You know, was I qualified? Did I prepare enough? You know, could it actually somebody be better than me? I ask all those questions first <laughs> before we get to you know, some other conclusion. And it's being incredibly liberating for me as a student. And so when I get back to campus and I see the progress we made in just, you know, the sheer numbers of people that um, from a diversity standpoint, um, it, it actually, it strikes a lot of emotion in me. And actually, I, I actually got a chance to speak to a group of the students at a banquet a couple of years ago. And I actually, I couldn't speak for the first couple of minutes. I was just overwhelmed by what I, I saw in the audience, the reflection of the, the brown and the black skin students and the students of color and the people that supported them, all their allies sitting in the room together. I just was overwhelmed by the moment. And the great things we're doing around, um, you know, inclusion with Jean Arnold and the, she's working on what I think is the toughest trick in all of this when it comes to inclusion and diversity. It's not the diversity part, it's the inclusion piece. Absolutely. And I see us making a lot of strides in that area. I'm very proud of the work that's been done. Well, it is a commitment that I have. It's a commitment that predates me. It's a commitment of this college. We still have a lot of work to do, but uh, we are determined to do it. And you and others help make it possible by creating the environment where um, that work uh, can, can take root. I want to say one other thing about your story about the dean. And it is a reminder of something I say to students frequently, which is, life has a bit of serendipity to it. And part of what you need to do is to be open to it. Be open yes. to the possibilities that will present themselves to you. Because if you go in with blinders, um, you may find a path that speaks to you, but you may not. Um, 
So be open to your, your life story, I think is an example of being open to the possibilities that emerge unexpectedly. Well, you know, I, I don't know where the path is necessarily headed. I've taken some detours along the way, um, you know, and what I realized is I never look back. So, um, and that's, you know, there are no regret decisions that I make and I just kind of move forward. And I learned that right on that campus. You know, I would try things, I would quit things. I would start something else. I would join another club. I would uh, run for office or this thing or that thing. And, and uh, all of those things really matter. So. You know, so I was going to ask you, what advice would you give for students? And I think you, in a sense, just answered it, right? Um, be open, try things, learn about yourself. But yeah, I actually, you know, I, I get a chance to speak to a lot of students, Bob, you know, and I find it um, an opportunity for me to give back. So I actually um, spend a lot of time at conferences, uh, speaking to uh, high school students, as well as college uh, students as well. And I tell them a couple things. One, I always say, don't act like a freshman. So like, don't sit back and watch other people like jump in and contribute. Like you have something to bring to the table. If you're invited to the party, like you, you should dance. And so um, I always tell people don't act like a freshman. The other thing is um, you, know, you just mentioned, I take some chances, like never look back. And um, you know, one thing I always tell people, there's a phrase that I actually hate more than any other phrase that I deal with in the work that I do. And that is when people say to me, hey, you know, Trev, check the box. I'm ready for the next thing. And I think all our jobs is to really to reinvent the box. And so I, I really challenge folks to walk in any situation, uh, take a little bit of advice from the person that was in that role before you, but ignore most of it because you need to find ways to do that work very differently and to have an impact. And so that's, that's one of those things that I always leave people with is, is uh, you know, reinvent the work and the box and make your, uh, you know, make a difference um, so that it's done differently when you walk out of that responsibility. Which I think